the White Mall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA. The White Mall by Frank L. Packard. Chapter 15 In the Council Chamber. The man with the withered hand had passed through into the other room. She heard them talking together as she followed. She forced herself to walk with as nearly a leisurely defiant air as she could. The last time she had been with Dangler, as Gypsy Nan, she had, in self-protection, forbidding intimacy, played up what he called her grouch at his neglect of her. She paused in the doorway. Halfway across the room, at the table, Dangler's gaunt, swarthy face showed under the rays of a shaded oil lamp. Behind her spectacles, she met his small, black, ferret eyes steadily. "'Hello, Bertha,' he called out cheerily. "'How's the old girl tonight?' He rose from his seat and came toward her. "'And how's the cold?' Rhoda Gray scowled at him. "'Worse,' she said, curtly and hoarsely. "'And a lot you care. I could have died in that hole for all you knew.' She pushed him irritably away as he came near her. "'Yes, that's what I said.' You needn't start any cooing game now. Get down to cases. She jerked her hand toward the twisted figure that had slouched into a chair beside the table. He says you've got it doped out to pull something that will let me out of this Gypsy Nan stunt. Another bubble, I suppose. She shrugged her shoulders, glanced around her, and locating a chair, not too near the table, seated herself indifferently. I'm getting sick of bubbles, she announced insolently. What's this one? He stood there for a moment, biting at his lips, hesitant between anger and tolerant amusement, and then, the latter evidently gaining ascendancy, he too shrugged his shoulders and laughed and returned to his chair. "'You're a rare one, Bertha,' he said coolly. "'I thought you'd be wild with delight. I guess you're sick, all right, because you're usually pretty sensible. I've tried to tell you that it wasn't my fault I couldn't go near you, and that I had to keep away from—' "'What's the use of going over all that again?' she interrupted tartly. "'I guess I—' "'Oh, all right,' said Dangler hurriedly. "'Don't start a row. "'After tonight I've an idea you'll be sweet enough to your husband, "'and I'm willing to wait. "'Maddie maybe hasn't told you the whole of it. "'Maddie. "'So that was the deformed creature's name. "'She glanced at him. "'He was grinning broadly. "'A family squabble seemed to afford him amusement.' Her eyes shifted and made a circuit of the room. It was poverty-stricken in appearance, bare-floored, with the scantiest and cheapest of furnishings, its only window tightly shuttered. "'Maybe not,' she said carelessly. "'Well, then, listen, Bertha,' Dangler's voice was lowered earnestly. "'We've uncovered the nabob's stuff. Do you get me? Every last one of the sparklers.' Rhoda Gray's eyes went back to the deformed creature at Dangler's side, as the man laughed out abruptly. "'Yes,' grinned Matty Dangler, "'and they weren't in the empty money-belt that you beat it with, like a scared cat after croaking Deemer. How queer and dim the light seemed to go suddenly, or was it a blur before her own eyes? She said nothing. Her mind seemed to be groping its way out of the darkness towards some faint gleam of light showing in the far distance.' She heard Dangler order his brother savagely to hold his tongue. That was curious, too, because she was grateful for the man's jibe. Gypsy Nan, in her proper person, had murdered a man named Deemer in an effort to secure— Dangler's voice came again. "'Well, tonight we'll get that stuff. All of it. It's worth a cool half-million. And tonight we'll get Mr. House Detective Clorin for keeps. Bump him off. That cleans everything up. How does that strike you, Bertha?' Rhoda Gray's hands under her shawl locked tightly together. Her premonition had not betrayed her. She was face to face tonight with the beginning of the end. "'It sounds fine,' she said derisively. Dangler's eyes narrowed for an instant, and then he laughed. "'You're a rare one, Bertha,' he ejaculated again. "'You don't seem to put much stock in your husband lately.' "'Why should I?' she inquired imperturbably. "'Things have been breaking fine, haven't they?' only not for us. She cleared her throat, as though it were an effort to talk. I'm not going crazy with joy till I've been shown. Dangler leaned suddenly over the table. Well, 
"'Come and look at the cards, then,' he said impressively. "'Pull your chair up to the table, and I'll tell you.' Rhoda Gray tilted her chair instead, nonchalantly back against the wall. It was quite light enough where she was. "'I can hear you from here,' she said coolly. "'I'm not deaf, and I guess Mattie's suite is safe enough so that you won't have to whisper all the time.' The deformed creature at the table chortled again. Dangler scowled. "'Damn you, Bertha,' he flung out savagely. I could wring that neck of yours sometimes, and— I know you could, Pierre, she interposed sweetly. That's what I like about you. You're so considerate of me. But suppose you get down to cases. What's the story about those sparklers? And what's the game that's going to let me shed this gypsy nan stuff for keeps? I'll tell her, Pierre, grinned the deformed one. It'll keep you two from spitting at one another. And neither of you have got all night to stick around here. He swung his withered hand suddenly across the table, and as suddenly all facetiousness was gone from his voice and manner. "'Say, you listen hard, Bertha. What Pierre's telling you is straight. You and him can kiss and make up tomorrow, or the next day, or whenever you damn well please. But tonight there ain't any more time for scrapping. Now listen. I handed you a rap about beating it with the empty money belt the night you croaked Deemer with an overdose of knockout drops in the private room up at the Hotel Marwitz.' But you forget that. I ain't starting any argument about that. None of us blames you. We thought the stuff was in the belt, too. And none of us blames you for making a mistake, and going too strong with the drops, either. Anybody might do that. And I'll say now that I take my hat off to you for the way you locked Clorin into the room with the dead man, and made your escape when Clorin had you dead to rights for the murder. And I'll say, too, that the way you've played Gypsy Nan, and saved your skin, and ours, too, is as slick a piece of work as has ever been pulled in the underworld. That puts you straight, you and me, don't it, Bertha? Rhoda Gray blinked at the man through her spectacles. Her brain was whirling in a mad turmoil. I always liked you, Mattie, she whispered softly. Dangler was lolling back in his chair, blowing smoke rings into the air. She caught his eyes fixed quizzically upon her. "'Go on, Mattie,' he prompted. "'You'll have her in a good humor if you're not careful.' We were playing more or less blind after that. The withered hand traced an aimless pattern on the table with its crooked and half-closed fingers, and the man's face was puckered into a shrewd, reminiscent scowl. The papers couldn't get a lead on the motive for the murder, and the police weren't talking for publication. Not a word about the Rajah's jewels. Washington saw to that— a young potentate's son, practically a guest of the country, touring about in a special for the sake of his education, and dashed near ending it in the river out west if it hadn't been for the rescue you know about, wouldn't look well in print, so there wasn't anything said about the slather of gems that was a reward of heroism from a grateful nabob, and we didn't get any help that way. All we knew was that Deemer came east with the jewels, presumably to cash in on them, and it looked as though Deemer were pretty clever— that he wore the money belt for a stall, and that he had the sparklers safe somewhere else all the time. And I guess we all got to figuring it that way, because the fact that nothing was said about the theft was strictly along the lines the police were working anyway, and was a toss-up that they hadn't found the stuff among his effects. Get me? Get him? This wasn't real, was it? This room here? Those two figures sitting there under the shaded lamp? Something cold, an icy grip, seemed to seize at her heart, as in a surge there swept upon her the full appreciation of her peril through these confidences to which she was listening. A word, in act, some slightest thing might so easily betray her, and then— Her fingers under the shawl, and inside the wide pocket of her greasy skirt, clutched at her revolver. Thank God for that. It would at least be merciful. She nodded her head mechanically. But the police didn't find the jewels, because they weren't there to be found. Somebody else got in ahead of us. Pinched em, understand? Maybe only a few hours before you got in your last play, and from the way you say Deemer acted, before he was wise to the fact he'd been robbed. Rhoda Gray let her chair come sharply down to the floor. She must play her role of Bertha now, as she never had before. Here was a question that she could not only ask with safety, but one that was obviously expected. "'Who was it?' she demanded breathlessly. "'She's coming to life,' murmured Dangler, through a haze of cigarette smoke. "'I thought you'd wake up after a while, Bertha. "'This is the big night, old girl, as you'll find out before we're through.' 
"'Who was it?' she repeated with well-simulated impatience. "'I guess she'll listen to me now,' said Dangler with a little chuckle. "'Don't overtax yourself any more, Mattie. "'I'll tell you, Bertha, and it will, perhaps, make you feel better "'to know that it took the slickest dip New York ever knew "'to beat you to the tape. "'It was Angel Jack, alias the Gimp. "'How do you know?' Rhoda Gray demanded. "'Because,' said Dangler, and lighted another cigarette, "'he died yesterday afternoon in Sing Sing.' "'She could afford to show her frank bewilderment. "'Her brows knitted into furrows as she stared at Dangler. "'You—you you mean he confessed?' she said. "'The angel? Never,' Dangler laughed grimly and shook his head. "'Nothing like that. "'It was a question of playing one fence against another.' "'You know that Witzer, who's handled all our jewelry for us, "'has been on the lookout for any stones that might have come from that collection. "'Well, this afternoon he passed the word to me "'that he had been offered the finest unset emerald he'd ever seen, "'and that it came to him through old Jake Lurtz's runner, "'a very innocent young man who's known to the trade as the Crab.' "'Dangler paused and laughed again. "'Unconsciously Rhoda Gray drew her jaw a little closer about her shoulders.' It seemed to bring a chill into the room, that laugh. Once before, on another night, Dangler had laughed, and with his parted lips she had likened him to a beast showing its fangs. He looked it now more than ever. For all his ease of voice and manner, he was in deadly earnest, and if there was merriment in his laugh, it but seemed to enhance the menace and the promise of unholy purpose that lurked in the cold glitter of his small black eyes. It didn't take long to get hold of the crab— Dangler was rubbing his hands together softly, and the emerald with him. We got him where we could put the screws on him without arousing the neighborhood. "'Another murder, I suppose,' Rhoda Gray flung out the words crossly. "'Oh, no,' Dangler said pleasantly. "'He squealed before it came to that. "'He's none the worse for wear, and he'll be turned loose in another hour or so, "'as soon as we get through old Jake Lurtz's. "'He's no more good to us. "'He came across all right.' "'after he was properly frightened. "'He's been with old Jake as a sort of familiar for the last six years, and... "'He'd have sold his soul, he was so scared. "'The withered hand on the table twitched, "'the deformed creature's face twisted into a grimace, "'and the man was chuckling with unhallowed mirth, "'as though unable to contain himself at presumably "'the recollection of the scene which he had witnessed himself. "'He was down on his knees and clawing out with his hands for mercy, "'and he squealed like a rat.' "'It's the sixth panel in the bedroom upstairs,' he says. "'It's all there. "'But for God's sake, don't tell Jake I told. "'It's the sixth panel. "'Press the knot in the sixth panel that—' "'He stopped abruptly. "'Dangler had pulled out his watch, "'and with exaggerated patience was circling the crystal with his thumb. "'Are you all through, Mattie?' he inquired monotonously. "'I think you said something a little while ago about wasting time. "'Bertha's looking bored.' "'And besides, she's got a little job of her own on for tonight.' "'He jerked his watch back into his pocket and turned to Rhoda Gray again. "'The only one who knew all the details, Angel Jack, "'and he'll never tell now because he's dead. "'Whether he came down from the west with Deemer or not, "'or how he got wise to the stones, I don't know. "'But he got the stones all right. "'And then he tumbled to the fact that the police were pushing him hard for another job he was wanted for, and he had to get those stones out of sight in a hurry. He made a package of them and slipped them to old Lurtz, who had always done his business for him, to keep for him, and before he could duck, the bulls had him for that other job. Angel Jack went up the river. See? Old Jake didn't know what was in that package, but he knew better than to monkey with it, because he always thought something of his own skin. He knew Angel Jack, and he knew what would happen if he didn't have that package ready to hand back the day Angel Jack got out of Sing Sing. Understand? And yesterday Angel Jack died, without a will, and old Jake appointed himself sole executor, without bonds. He opened that package, figured he'd begin turning it into money, and that's how we get our own back again. Old Jake will get a fake message tonight, calling him out of the house on an errand uptown. "'and about ten o'clock Pinky Bon and the Pug will pay a visit there in his absence. "'And, well, it looks good, don't it, Bertha? After two years?' "'Rhoda Gray was crouched down in her chair. "'She shrugged her shoulders now, and infused a sullen note into her voice. "'Yes, it's fine,' she sniffed. 
I'll be rolling in wealth in my garret, which will do me a lot of good. That doesn't separate me from these rags and the hell I've lived, does it? After two years. I'm coming to that, said Dangler with a short, grating laugh. We've as good as got the stones now, and we're going through tonight for a clean up of all that old mess. We staked the whole thing. Get me, Bertha? The whole thing. I'm showing my hand for the first time. Clorin's the man that's making you wear those clothes. Clorin's the only one who could go into the witness box and swear that you were the woman who murdered Deemer. And Clorin's the man who has been working his head off for two years to find you. We've tried a dozen times to bump him off in a way that would make his death appear to be purely an accident, and we didn't get away with it. But we can afford to leave the accident out of it tonight and go through for keeps, and that's what we're going to do. And once he's out of the way, by midnight, you can heave Gypsy Nan into the discard. It seemed to Rhoda Gray that horror had suddenly taken a numbing hold on her sensibilities. Dangler was talking about murdering some man, wasn't he? So that she could resume again the personality of a woman who was dead. Hysterical laughter rose to her lips. It was only by a frantic effort of will that she controlled herself. She seemed to speak involuntarily. Doubtful almost that it was her own voice she heard. I'm listening, she said, but I wouldn't be too sure. Clorin's a wary bird, and there's the white mall. She caught her breath. What suicidal inspiration had prompted her to say that? Had what she been listening to here, the horror of it, indeed turned her brain and robbed her of her wits to the extent that she should invite exposure? Dangler's face had gone a mottled purple. The misshapen thing at Dangler's side was leering at her most curiously. It was a moment before Dangler spoke, and then his hand, clenched until the white of the knuckles showed, pounded upon the table to punctuate his words. Not tonight, he rasped out with an oath. There's not a chance that she's in on this tonight, the she devil. But she's next. With this cleaned up, she's next. If it takes the last dollar of tonight's haul and five years to do it, I'll get her and get. Sure, mumbled Rhoda Gray hurriedly, but you needn't get excited. I was only thinking of her because she's queered us till I've got my fingers crossed, that's all. Go on about Clorin. Dangler's composure did not return on the instant. He gnawed at his lips for a moment before he spoke. All right, he jerked out finally. Let it go at that. I told you the other night in the garret that things were beginning to break our way, and that you wouldn't have to stay there much longer, but I didn't tell you why or how. You wouldn't give me a chance. I'll tell you now, and it's the main reason why I've kept away from you lately. I couldn't take a chance of Clorin getting wise to that garret and Gypsy Nan. He grinned suddenly. I've been cultivating Clorin myself for the last two weeks. We're quite pals. I'm playing for luck every time. When the jewels showed up today, I figured that tonight's the night. See? Clorin and I are going to supper together at the Silver Sphinx at about eleven o'clock, and this is where you show up and shed the Gypsy Nan stuff and show up as your sweet self. Clorin'll be glad to meet you. She stared at him in genuine perplexity and amazement. Show myself to Clorin? she ejaculated heavily. I don't get you. You will in a minute, said Dangler softly. You're the bait. See? Clorin and I will be at supper and watching the fox trotters. You blow in and show yourself. I don't need to tell you how. You're clever enough at that sort of thing yourself. And the minute he recognizes you as the woman he's been looking for that murdered Deemer, you pretend to recognize him for the first time, too. And then you beat it like you had the scare of your life for the door. He'll follow you on the jump. I don't know what it's all about, and I sit tight, and that lets me out. And now get this. There'll be two taxicabs outside. If there's more than two, it's the first two I'm talking about. You jump in the one at the head of the line. Clorin won't need an invitation to grab the second one and follow you. That's all. It's the last ride he'll take. It'll be our boys, and not chauffeurs who'll be driving those cars tonight, and they've got their orders where to go. Clorin won't come back. Understand, Bertha? There was only one answer to make. Only one answer that she dared make. She made it mechanically, though her brain reeled. A man named Clorin was to be murdered, and she was to show herself as this, this Bertha, and. Yes, she said. Good, said Dangler. 
He pulled out his watch again. All right, then. We've been here long enough, he rose briskly. It's time to make a move. You hop back to the garret and get rid of that fancy dress. I've got to meet Clorin uptown first. Come on, Maddie, let us out. The place stifled her. She got up and moved quickly through the intervening room. She heard Dangler and his crippled brother talking earnestly together as they followed her. And then the cripple brushed past her in the darkness and opened the front door, and Dangler had drawn her to him in a quick embrace. She did not struggle, she dared not. Her heart seemed to stand still. Dangler was whispering in her ear. I promised I'd make it up to you, Bertha, old girl. You'll see, after tonight. We'll have another honeymoon. You go on ahead now. I can't be seen with Gypsy Nan. And don't be late. The Silver Sphinx at eleven. She ran out on the street. Her fingers mechanically clutched at her shawl to loosen it around her throat. It seemed as though she were choking, that she could not breathe. The man's touch upon her had seemed like a contact with some foul and loathsome thing. The scene in that back room there like some nightmare of horror from which she could not awake. End of chapter 15